Uh, Florida Craft Art is a member-supported organization founded in 1951. We are open seven days a week, and we feature more than 250 artists in our gallery, downtown St. Pete, right on the corner of Central and Fifth. I'm Tyler Jones with our board, and I am very fortunate to be our board president, and I notice a number of other board members. We are board-driven and volunteer-based. We have a, a small yet mighty staff and so i'd also like to thank all of our staff members that keep florida craft art doing all the wonderful things the incredible programming and we really appreciate you attending our event tonight in order to bring these quality exhibitions to our community free of charge we depend on sponsorships we depend on our community and you our sponsors our main sponsor for epicurean delight is mark anderson and keith Bucklew, along with the support from Terry and Lisa Everett, and William Dean Chocolates. So thank you to all our sponsors. We hope that you visit our gallery and see the deliciously created art, such as heart-shaped bowls and fruit fashioned from glass. This pair of wooden chairs by Nick Rialli was awarded an honorable mention. You can't come and sit in them necessarily, but you can definitely admire the craftsmanship. Even our jewelers were inspired by the theme. As you can see with these four lovely pieces. So to accompany our exhibitions, we offer extremely rich and vibrant programming to accompany the theme. Tonight, we're delighted that we are joined and enjoy a presentation by Peter Tush, who's the curator of education for the Dali Museum. Peter has his undergraduate degree in art history from New College in Sarasota and his master's in art history from the University of South Florida. He's a key, a key interpreter of the Dali collection and special exhibitions. He trains the Dali docents, scripts the audio guides, develops Dali school programming and student exhibit, and works with the curatorial team to develop special exhibitions. Over the years, he has presented on a wide range of Dali-related topics, including surrealism in women, Dali in Hollywood. Tush is the co-host of Step Outside, Wednesday evenings on WMNF 88.5 FM, Tampa. We're so pleased that tonight Peter is presenting Dining with Dali for Florida Craft Art. Please join me in welcoming Peter Tush. Peter? Hello, everybody. Um, thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you to Katie for the invitation. And I am very pleased to be with you all. I know many of you who have joined us have probably heard a version of this at one point or another. Um, so hopefully I won't be treading on too much ground one more time, but I think um, I've got some things that I would like to share with you that I think will be very intriguing and will amplify the ideas of the Florida Craftsman Gallery with the uh, exhibition. So what I'm going to do now is share my screen and we can go right into the talk. So first thing, just to let everybody know, so there's no surprise, there are some very off-colored areas of this, uh, this talk. And depending on who's within earshot, I just want you to be aware that it's not all um, uh, G-rated. That said, um, some of it's, like I said, a little bit off color, but it certainly brings out a lot about Salvador Dali, um, this gentleman that, uh, that I have worked for for many years now. So the title of the talk that I'm presenting is called Dining with Dali. It's gonna focus on gastronomy, cannibalism, and edible architecture. So lots of lots of fun stuff to share with you. As we're going through this, if, um, if you do have any questions, feel free to use the chat room and then I'll be happy to circle back at the end of the talk. But um, <laughs> this talk is about the exquisite pleasure and horror of consumption. And this is a photo that I truly love. This is from uh, the Dolly Cookbook, which I'll be getting to at the very end of this talk. It's a photograph of Maxime's in uh, Paris one of the finest uh, culinary um, epicenters. And this is this extraordinary feast that was prepared under Dolly's direction. So we'll be coming back and talking about that towards the end, but um, there is indeed lots and lots of food related uh, substance that I'm gonna be sharing with you from an artistic point of view. So what I'm gonna explore in this talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about eating and then a little bit about how food becomes symbolic for Dolly. We're going to talk a little bit about Dali and cannibalism because you can't eat unless you devour. And so there's, uh, there's certainly a fascination he has with that idea. 
Uh, we're going to move into edible architecture, and then for better or worse, into digestion and excretion. And then finally, the last portion of the talk is going to focus on the Dali cookbook and dining with Dali, the Dalinian uh, dining uh, uh, focus. So there's a great quote to open this with, which I think sort of sets the stage perfectly. Um, at the age of six, Dolly says, at the age of six, I wanted to be a cook. At the age of seven, I wanted to be Napoleon. And my ambition has been growing steadily ever since. The Napoleon part is probably not a surprise. The idea of a cook is maybe a bit of a surprise. I believe by the end of this talk, it will not be a surprise at all. So the very first thing to discuss is the idea of lips and jaws, the way that we actually crunch the food that we uh, digest. And there's this really over-the-top erotic quote that Dolly has in The Secret Life almost at the very beginning. He says, the most philosophical organs man possesses are his jaws. What indeed is more philosophic than the moment when you slowly suck in the marrow of a bone that is being powerfully crushed in the final destructive embrace of your molars? For it is that supreme moment of reaching the marrow of anything that you discover the very taste of truth. And this is a very um, uh, decadent drawing that Dolly did, I believe, for the uh, Marquis de Sade suite. But um, you can see this process is about to be engaged in. <clears throat> and just to review some of these ideas about Dolly and chopping down on things, there's a wonderful brooch, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the ruby lips with the teeth of pearls brooch. It was done somewhere around 1949 to 1952. It was made with this exquisite uh, collection of all these really pristine gems, but is really a very kitsch, over-the-top kind of uh, a play on the idea of the ruby lips with teeth of pearls. It's a very bad pun turned into a kind of exquisite piece of kitsch jewelry. Dolly also designed a sofa. This one was inspired by um, Mae West and her luscious lips. So you actually sit upon the lips representing the kind of erotic embrace re represented by Mae West. Speaking of eroticism and sucking and consuming, this is a, um, a still from the movie, The Age of Gold, that Dolly made with Louis Spoonwell, where the particular star engages in sucking the toe of a sculpture. So that idea, again, consumption, but also verging on cannibalism is a big part of this. Uh, we also have here, <laughs> a very appropriate uh, and very perverse um, image. This is called Freud's Perverse Polymorph. And what Dolly has done is taken this, you know, cherubic image of this young child and placed this hideous rat in its mouth as if he's chomping down, combining both the beatific and the horrifying at the same time. He's having a lot of fun with this. I think that's the most important thing is Dolly brings together high and low beauty and horror pretty often in similar, uh, similar amounts. Um, I want to share with you a long quote about Dolly's childhood from The Secret Life, his autobiography, because I think it really sets, in, sets the tone for how Dolly approaches food, which is probably very similar to the way he would describe um, sex as well. He says, and this is going back to his childhood, sunset, the time for running to the kitchen garden, the time notorious for pressing out guilty juices of terrestrial gardens invaded by the evening breezes of original sin. Goes on to say, I would bite into everything, sugar beets, peaches, onions, tender as a new moon. I was so fearful of becoming satiated, of letting my temptations lose their edge too quickly by the botched fragility of my gluttony that I would only bite the desired fruit with a single impatient crunch of my teeth. And after having extracted from it its strict taste of desire, I would throw away the object of my seduction, the more quickly to grasp the rest of these fruits of the moment, whose taste was for my palate as ephemeral, as a fugitive flicker of fireflies that already began to shine in the deepest shadows of the growing vegetational darkness. At times, I would take a fruit and be content to touch it with my lips, to press it softly against my burning cheek. So I think uh, this extraordinary passage, which really is way over the top, is talking about one's pleasure with eating, and at the same time deferring that pleasure 
to sustain the excitement further. So very sustained sort of a transition there, but it's all about the food, which brings us to the section called the raw and the cooked. And this is a really extraordinary other detail that Dolly shares in his autobiography. Again, right at the beginning, shortly after he announces that at six, he wanted to be a cook. He says that I like to eat only things with well-defined shapes that the intelligence can grasp. I detest spinach because of its utterly amorphous character. The very opposite of spinach is armor. That is why I like to eat armor so much, and especially the small varieties, namely all shellfish. Which brings us to a really interesting conundrum. On the one hand, Dolly is saying he doesn't like to eat things that don't have much shape to them because he can't figure out, you know, intuitively what they represent. However, supposedly shellfish like lobsters and um, seashells provide the rigorous, which is missing from spinach. But when you actually look at what you're eating, there's almost no difference at all. They're both of utterly amorphous character. An oyster is no more formed and defined than spinach. And I think that's all deliberately constructed in Dolly's ideas to take you from one thing, show you what supposedly is the opposite, which brings you right back to the beginning again. And this allows us to talk about Dali and food in relation to symbolism. So the first bit of food that we're going to look at is bread. And for Dali, bread kind of creates its own universe. I did a talk um, about two months ago about Dali's obsession with bread. And very early on, he was using bread in a very traditional manner. So this painting from our collection of the basket of bread connects Dali with the Baroque, connects him with the Spanish Baroque and Jan Vermeer and the idea of bread as being both spiritual, but also sustenance, the most basic food required for all people in order to uh, sustain life. Not surprisingly, by the time Dolly becomes a surrealist, he changes his thoughts about this. And one of the most extraordinary paintings in our collection is the Catalan bread, which <laughs> just defies obvious uh, you know, subtlety in its interpretation. But obviously this has something to do with a fear of impotence as well as a kind of celebration of the French baguette, which is wrapped in the sheath. And you can see that melting um, oozing structure of the melting watch seems to amplify the fear, which is why this needs to be lassoed in order to maintain that kind of erect staunch uh, um, upright stance. And there's a little bit of ink and that inkwell that can be smeared on it. So at this point, Bread has become a symbol of a sexual fetish. However, we don't stop there because by the 1950s, bread once again goes through a transformation and becomes once again Eucharistic, this time very specifically spiritual related to the Catholic Church and the transformation of the bread during the Mass into the body of Christ. And so here's a painting that refers to the feeding of the multitudes from the Bible. It's called Nature More Evangelique. And you have three fish and also two loaves of very unusual looking bread, which is very much like the kind of bread you would bring out of your oven in a traditional Catalan restaurant. Now we move on to eggs, another wonderful form of eating and sustenance. And we begin right in the Surrealist period with a kind of um, sexual orientation. Clearly the, the egg, this is called eggs on a plate without the plate. And you have the two eggs on the plate, but the third egg is floating in space tied to the string. And, you know, the very first observation, which is very clear, is that this, once again, has to do with fear of impotence. It has to do with uh, something that's not erect, being supported. However, there's a couple other subtle shadings that makes this a little more interesting. The first is that Dolly, I think, is clearly referencing St. Lucy, who was martyred by having her eyes taken out and presented to her on a plate. So this is another one of the kind of medieval martyrdoms that uh, haunted Catholic faith and certainly influenced uh, Spanish spiritualism. And Dali is surprisingly paying a tribute to the woman who is uh, his, his partner and eventually will become his wife two years later. It was said that she had Gala, his wife, um, or soon to be wife, had a gaze that was so intense it could pierce walls. And so by placing these two eggs on this plate, Dolly is suggesting the intensity of his future wife's gaze, that there's a, they're as intense as these eggs that are seated here on this plate resembling St. Lucy's eyes. 
The second uh, connection is that Dolly said he was also thinking of an embryo, an embryo inside of the uterus. Dolly said that uh, during the period of time that uh, he was painting us, he would often engage in different activities to try to force him to see things from a different perspective, one of which is he would push, push his, put his fists tightly against his eyes. And if you do that and you start to feel a little bit of pressure, when you release your fists, you will see phosphines. You'll have irritated your eyes and there's like an after color that appears. Dolly said when he was looking at this, he had the memory of what it was like being an embryo inside his mother's womb. This is the quote. He says, the most striking vision when he was pushing his fist against his eyes was that of a pair of eggs fried in a pan without the pan. The eggs fried in a pan, uh, which I saw before my birth, were grandiose, phosphorescent, and very detailed in all the folds of their faintly bluish whites. And it goes on from there. But the idea here is that looking at these fried eggs, Dolly is thinking about this experience, which made him feel he was still embryonic in a pre-uterine uh, stage of his existence. So pretty extraordinary, not necessarily about eating, but certainly about food. And that brings us to a little bit later by 1937, Dolly actually uses an egg in this particularly unusual self-portrait. And this is one of those extraordinary double image paintings that Dolly uh, really was masterful in creating. The figure in yellow on the left-hand side, that's an image of Narcissus, the Greek figure who fell in love with his uh, reflection and basically drifted away. You can see right on top of his knee, you can see that round shape is actually the top of his head with his shoulders on either side. But when we look at this white shape on the right-hand side, what you'll see is it's actually like an ossified or bone-like hand holding an egg that sprouts a Narcissus flower. And Dolly observed that in Catalonia where he grew up, if someone was going mad, uh, some of the fishermen would refer to them as having a bulb in their head, like a, uh, like a narcissus bulb that was about to sprout, like you're nuts, you're crazy. And so the echo here going between the two shapes, which look the same, is that narcissus, basically a standard for Dali, has become this ossified, uh, crazy egg that's being held by the fingers. And with that, the next observation about food is cheese. And I think this brings to a close these uh, symbolic orientations. But this is a painting I'm sure all of you are familiar with from 1931. It's the most iconic image of surrealism. It's called The Persistence of Memory. And it's the painting where Dali created this almost, um, it looks like a fetus type of shape that's washed up on the beach. This fetus shape at the very bottom is Dali's own self-portrait. Seems to be a skull where the, or a face where the skull has been removed. And then you see the three melting watches on various um, places. Dolly said that when he was painting this work, everything about it was finished except for the watches. It was a hot day. He was in his uh, studio and he had some camembert cheese nearby. And he said out of the corner of his eye, the runny, oozy cheese started to resemble a melting watch. And it immediately gave him the inspiration to create these three additional melting watches, completing the painting and giving all of the kind of uncanny dreamlike qualities that this painting uh, you know, suggests. Um, other paintings seem to suggest cheese-like wedges as well. This is one called the Enigma of Desire. And all those little openings inside of that yellow form are very much like cheddar cheese openings. And Dolly will write in them all these little secret notes um, that, uh, that he's obsessed by. And that brings us to everyone's favorite subject, cannibalism. And this is one of the, this is this painting that you're looking at right now is about three inches across. It is a tiny, tiny painting. And this was brought with Dolly when he arrived in New York for the first time in 1937. He was greeted by a horde of press and they really got captivated by this particular painting. It's a painting of Dolly's wife, Gala, and on her shoulder is a, um, a lamb chop. And they were all, you know, pestering him, like, why did you paint a lamb chop on Gala's shoulder? And Dolly said, I like Gala and I like steak. Why would I not paint them together? So it's that idea that um, for something to be truly understood and fully absorbed, it also needs to be consumed and metaphorically cannibalized. So Gala is no different than this lamb chop that balances on our shoulder. 
And this, of course, brings to mind these horrific images, such as a Goya's image of Saturn devouring one of his children, one of the most haunting and horrifying images in Western culture. And this definitely informed some of Dali's paintings from the late 1930s after the Spanish Civil War. So for example, we have soft construction with boiled beans, premonition of civil war, where Dali is definitely, definitely referencing Goya. And what you have is a figure representing Spain that's become this kind of monstrous creature tearing itself apart. And to make that connection between the ripping itself apart and cannibalism, Dali says that one could not imagine swallowing all that unconscious meat without the presence of some mealy and melancholy vegetable, which namely is all these little beans, these boiled beans that are prominent through the painting. He also did a series called the uh, Songs of Maldoro, where you have figures that are slicing themselves apart, and they become meat, and they become bread, and they become self-consuming. He also painted something called Autumn Cannibalism, where you have a very lovely couple, seemingly very aristocratic, using very polite uh, and proper use of all of their, um, their uh, utensils in order to very daintily uh, cannibalize each other slowly, but, uh, but um, forcefully. Which brings us to the mother cannibal, the mother as cannibal. And Dali had an obsession in the mid-1930s with Jean-Francois Millet, and particularly this painting called The Angelus. And it seems to be, and it has always been thought of, as a very lovely couple giving thanks to the Lord for the day's harvest, praying at 6 p.m. during the ringing of the Angelus um, bell. And what Dali reveals in his obsession is that this painting for Dali is actually a couple burying their child, but more importantly, the female is very much like a praying mantis in his mind who devours the male in, after, after mating. And so what we see here is uh, an example of one of several paintings where Dali has reinterpreted the couple from Malay's paintings. Here we see the female is more like a mantis shape and the arrangement, the male being afraid of being discovered but being aroused by the female who wants to cannibalize him seems to have haunted this landscape for generations. So they become architecture. They become these large towers. On the flip side of this is the father cannibalism. And Dolly definitely had a lot of father issues. And so this kind of taking this idea and turning it into a myth was something very comfortable for him. And this is an example of where Dolly goes with this idea. He sees himself as the son of Saturn, that his father is very much like Saturn, who will devour his children um, in order to protect himself from the, the threat that they will represent later. And so this constant father-son struggle, the classic Oedipal struggle, is seen in a number of paintings, including this image of uh, William Tell, where there's not a lot of consumption going on, but clearly there's a pair of scissors that will do certain damage to the son once he is uh, confronted by the father. And that brings us to this really lovely <laughs> and wonderful photograph. This is a photograph of Salvador Dali's father and his stepmother. And it's, from a, it's a still from a movie by Luis Manuel where Dali's father consumes a large number of sea urchins. He just has a huge plate. They're the sea urchins from the bay right in front of his house. He is truly just thrilled by the ability to eat all of these wonderful sea urchins, these shell crustaceans. And what's really remarkable about it is that it was his favorite food. So when Dolly and his father got into a terrible fight and he was thrown out of the family house, the first thing he did is he, he shaved off all of his hair and he put a sea urchin on his head. And this is the crazy idea. You just got to go with it. And I'm sure this is no crazier than anything else I've said. But Dolly was thinking of himself in relation to William Tell and his son. William Tell is the Swiss archer from folk legends who was able to win the freedom for him and his son by accepting the, uh, the ruler's command that he shoot an, an arrow and shoot the apple on his son's head and doesn't harm the, the son. Dolly turns that into a story where obviously the son is to be harmed. He is to be killed. And so what Dolly has done here is he's taken his father's favorite food, placed it on his head, and it's kind of a placebo idea. If the father sees the sea urchin, which he really loves to devour, perhaps he will not get to Dali. Dali will be able to escape because he's distracted by the lovely sea urchin. 
crazy story, but that's the way Dolly is thinking at this point in the 1930s, and it all has to do with food and eating. And then I just wanted to share this image with you before we shift gears. This is um, a self-portrait that Dolly used when he painted when he wrote his uh, autobiography in the 1940s. It's a very kind of depressing, kind of horrifying self-portrait where Dolly has become this flayed bit of flesh without a skull. And then he's placed a piece of grilled bacon next to his own face, suggesting that you would need to eat it along with a little bit of protein in order to digest it properly. So it's a really strange and very unsettling self-portrait, but again, it has to do with consumption. And that brings us to edible architecture. Because in 1934 and 1933, Dolly developed this concept that beauty needs to be edible. It needs to be able to be consumed. If something is beautiful, it should also be edible. And he wrote that he got this idea from looking at particular sculptural forms and architecture forms, which have a, a quality about them that looks like they should be consumed. And so, for example, um, the metro stops in Paris that were from the late 19th century, they suggested to Dolly, as this one on the left-hand side does, the female figure from the Malays Angeles, that kind of um, uh, praying mantis type shape. But he also found these images, which he paid Versailles to photograph for him to use with this article that he wrote. They also had a kind of edible quality, almost like something you'd find in a pastry shop or a bakery. And he goes on to say that, you know, for him, the most edible architecture of all is this particular building, Casa Mila, right in downtown Barcelona, created by Antoni Gaudi in the late 19th century. And it's just a, a collection of undulating lines with no right angles. And for Dali, this looked like it was like the most edible of all architecture, almost like a wedge of cheese on a massive scale. And in a kind of Alice in Wonderland world, you could just go up and start consuming it. So he's very much kind of thinking in this very irrational manner about how eating has to do with our understanding of the world around us. And when he finally built his own museum, which opened in 1974 in Figuera, Spain, he lined the top of the building with eggs and he lined the surface of this particular extension, the, um, the Torre Galatea, this building to the right, this red one, all those little punctuated marks are loaves of bread that Dolly has cast and glued onto the side like ornamentation on a big cake. So definitely this is all about edible architecture and the kind of creative artistic process of imagining something that's related to food. And then we're going to just very briefly touch on digestion and excretion because it also is a big part of the way Dolly approaches all of this. Um, this is a great photograph of Dolly. This was a, a large... Um, um, banquet Dolly threw out in Carmel, California, in Pebble Beach, uh, in order to raise money. And he had an extraordinary cast of people invited. There were people like Bob Hope and Jimmy Coogan, and I think uh, Victoria Vanderbilt. And then there was also this extraordinary number of animals that Dolly had brought from the local zoo, and it was a really over-the-top experience. But you can see him here. He's created himself with three faces, sort of a... Um, uh, split personality, and in the middle, what he's showing you is his insides, his guts, his stomach, his lungs, and Dolly says that my enlightenment is born and propagated through my guts. So intelligence comes from consumption, which has to do with one's bodily fluids and digestion. There's a great photograph here by uh, Philippe Paulsman, Dolly having an atomic explosion from his mouth. He says, I personally indulge in atomic explosions. And that brings us to this particular figure. All of you who have heard my talks at the Dolly Museum, you've seen this many times, but if you're new to me or this particular line of thinking, this is definitely something I need to share with you. This particular figure is known throughout Catalonia as the Cagane. It is a figure that shows up in the back of a manger scene during Christmas time in a typical Catalan house. It probably has medieval, um, a medieval origin, but the idea is that this is a Catalan peasant. He is taking a crap and basically giving back to the earth what was harvested from the earth. So it's a kind of cycle of life, birth, and rebirth. And 
believe it or not, these figures, these little um, uh, ceramic figures, are placed behind the manger scene. But it's known all throughout Catalonia. So it is a very particular local tradition that surprisingly shows up in art. And so, for example, here is a painting by Juan Miro, Dali's Catalan colleague and also a surrealist. This is called Man and Woman in Front of a Pile of Excrement. And you can see the sort of horror being expressed by these two very strange looking characters. And the bit of excrement is actually the bit over to the right hand side that looks like a cobra. So very comical, very cartoonish, but very much coming out of the same tradition. And that brings us to Dali's early paintings where he tried to use this idea of excrement as a terrorizing element, an element of horror. And so in this particular painting, The Accommodations of Desire, this brown landscape is brown because Dali is thinking of it as excrement. Horrifying, right? Yes, you are right. Um, Dali has a really interesting quote about this from a little, little bit later from the 1950s. He says, temporal immortality must be looked for in refuse, in excrement and nowhere else. And since man's highest mission on earth is to spiritualize everything, it is his excrement in particular that needs it most. As a result, I increasingly dislike all scatological jokes and all forms of frivolity on the subject. And if you believe that, um, you know, I've got some land that I can sell you very cheap. Uh, which brings us to the final section of this talk, the, the area that will be the most familiar to you and perhaps the most enjoyable, although still filled with a little bit of strangeness, and that's the idea of cooking. In 1973, Dolly published a really fabulous project. I don't think he was solely responsible for it in the slightest. I believe he had a lot of help with it, but it is a total Dalinian experience. It's called Le Diné de Dali, the din or Le Diné de Gala, the Dinners of Gala. It's a cult cookbook. It was made in conjunction with the, uh, the chef of Maxime's and a few other key chefs from uh, other culinary um, institutes. And they actually put together this extraordinary feast from all of these recipes that are collected in there. And there are some extraordinary recipes, some really horrifying things for goat testicles and um, brains of small birds and all kinds of things. But there's also some very practical ones as well. So this kind of extraordinary over the top, almost medieval notion of how you eat and drink is the feature of uh, Dolly's cookbook. Here we go. There's recipes for a thousand year old eggs. There's recipes for conger eel, for crayfish consomme, for peacock and for aphrodisiacs. So you get the idea. This is a very sumptuous, extraordinary, and not very practical um, endeavor. What's really fun is that throughout this book, there are extraordinary illustrations, and they are really a lot of fun. And they're inspired by illustrations from this original 1800 cookbook um, from the Royal Book of Cookery. 1868, it was published. Lots of great illustrations, including, for example, this particular image of a uh, head of, um, I guess it's beef, uh, au natural. And so what Dolly does is he looks at these illustrations from the original book, and he tries to find what's missing. He tries to amplify it, bring out the strangeness. And so looking at this image, we can see how Dolly has transformed it in this next image, where it now sprouts a mustache, it has two eyes, it becomes a much more menacing sort of, it looks like a bit of pie that's about to come attack us. Uh, similarly, Dolly has taken this shellfish uh, tower and transforms it into something a little more hideous, which is this, um, this particular poor martyred saint from the Catholic faith whose arms appear to be chopped off and blood is flowing down all aspects of this tower. There's all of these saints that seem to have been uh, killed at the bottom of this. And then there's this sort of extraordinary wormy dance of what looks like sausages coming from the um, shellfish. And we move on to another one, perhaps the most comical and perhaps blasphemous at the same time. This was in the original book from 1868. This is uh, the chicken and how to properly cut it. And Dolly transforms the figure on the right-hand side into basically the Shroud of Turin with the um, covering the chicken, but you can see the image of Christ that has been uh, transferred onto the veil. 
And that brings us to the very final part of this. Perhaps with a great relief, we move into civility and proper dining. And Dolly was not only fascinated by food, he was fascinated by what we use, the cutlery that we use to eat it. And here's a very extraordinary 1932 painting where a spoon appears to take on a life of its own, almost like the mate from um, uh, the Terminator where that sort of uh, iron or mercury created creature was able to constantly ooze out a kind of extra substance to extend itself. And that seems to be what's going on here. It's like the, uh, the spoon has become almost a snake moving around this particular rock or piece of bread that's in the middle. By 1957, Dolly designs one of the most wonderful sets of cutlery I think I've encountered. He calls it the mollusk shell cutlery. You can see the small spoon and the large spoon have um, a mollusk shell at the very base, and then they open up into this kind of extraordinary interior of a mollusk with the spoon part. The um, the two forks are really wonderful. Or the yeah, the two forks are really nice. The one on the top, of course, has the um, elephant tusk, the ivory tusk of an elephant, which become the prongs. And the one closest to us is the, uh, the snake with its uh, forked tongue. So a lot of puns going on here, but really extraordinary, great fun. And the final, final things to share with you are just a couple shots of dining with Dolly. This is Dolly throwing a very appropriate but modest uh, Mediterranean dinner for um, Walt Disney and his wife who visited uh, Dolly in his house. And here he is with Dolly on the side. Um, when Dolly met the Marx Brothers, he was interested in trying to create a screenplay for them, which never got off the ground. But this was one of the illustrations where Dolly imagined a very large, proper, upper-class dining experience that would be conducted in the middle of the desert, and it would be lit by burning giraffes. Uh, not surprisingly, it was not created, but nevertheless, the imagination flows through in this image. And of course, the Last Supper, where Dolly responds to uh, Leonardo da Vinci with the breaking of the bread and the serving of the wine, which is the transference through the meal into the body and blood of Christ. He's surrounded by his, um, his disciples, but you can see that there is this moment of social gathering where the kind of ritualistic um, aspect of eating is focused upon. And then just to mention that uh, one of the things Dolly did with great regularity when he was in New York and when he was in Paris, in order to wine and dine clients and friends and people who wanted to make business deals, he always took them to extraordinary restaurants. And he always made sure someone else was paying the bill. So Dolly never picked up the tab, but he, was always, uh, he would always mix in these meetings um, a mixture of high class people who are trying to make deals, some artistic figures, and then some people he would meet outside on the street that he thought added a little bit of color. So his idea of dining was also to turn it into a kind of circus-like event. It was something that was very appropriate to him when doing these kind of public spectacle meals. In private, Dolly was more modest, although you would never know it from this particular wonderful photograph by Werner uh, Vogelberg. This is a uh, Lottie Tarp, who was a film actress, a Danish film actress, basically becoming the serving plate for the crustaceans that Dolly appears to be about to be dining upon. And the last thing to share with you is this particularly wonderful quote by Dolly. I can only paint after certain delirious occurrences happen in my digestive system. And so with that, I hope that this talk captured a little bit of the flavor of um, the exhibition at Florida Craftsman. It might add a little bit too much flavor, which I apologize for, but it seems like, uh, you know, an appropriately ample buffet of ideas to share with you from a surrealist perspective. Thank you so much, Peter. What a fantastic presentation and um, only you could do it as you did and modernize and, and reference the Terminator in, in a, a a dolly piece. So thank you so much for all of the incredible education and I'm sure everyone has enjoyed it as thoroughly as I have. Well, so thanks we, so much. Yes, I thanks so much, Peter. That was wonderful. I enjoyed it so much. And I want to add, I think the Dolly cookbook's available for purchase in the Dolly bookstore, isn't it? It is indeed. <laughs> Got it. Let's give it a plug. 
Thanks. I have my copy that my late husband purchased for me in 1973, right when it came out. <laughs> Did you ever fix any of the recipes? And no. <laughs> but I love looking at the artwork, and this made it so much more meaningful. I'm going to look at it again with fresh eyes. Thanks so much. Thanks. Well, thank you. We, we hope that you will all visit and tell your friends, family, make a friend and bring someone, anyone to our Epicurean Delights exhibition. So it is up and open through May 8th. Again, open seven days a week. And many thanks to our sponsors who have generously made the exhibit and all of our programming possible. Without you, we would not have such incredible community involvement. Come visit Florida Craft Art. And like I said, seven days a week and see the constantly changing stream of fine crafts, not just in our exhibition space, but in our wonderfully managed gallery space and our curated Florida artist only gallery space. Thanks for attending and we'll see you next Tuesday at the chocolate tasting. Everyone have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, Peter. Thanks. Bye.